भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदा स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 we were um doing the karikas following the seventh mantra so we have done karikas 11 to 14 let us uh, chant the karikas i'll chant them and please follow after me karika 10 te- onwards mm-hmm. after the seventh ma- uh, mantra karika 10 so let me chant the 10th karika and then please follow after me nivritte sarva dukhanam nivritte sarva dukhanam ishana prabhu rabhyaya ishana prabhu rabhyaya अद्वैत अद्वैत देवस्तुरियो विभुस्मृत देवस्तुरियो विभुस्मृत कार्यकारणबद्ध कार्यकारणबद्ध ईष्येते विश्वतैजसौ ईष्येते विश्वतैजसो प्राज्ञकारणबद्धस्त प्राज्ञकारणबद्धस्त दौतौ तुर्यन सिद्ध्यता दौतौ तुर्यन सिद्ध्यता नात्मा न परांगना न परांगश्चव न सत्यम नृत न सत्यम चापृत प्राज्ञ किंचन संवेत्ति प्राज्ञ किंचन संवेत्ति तुरीय तत्सृक्सदा तुरीय तत्सृक्सदा द्वैत सग्रहण तुल्य द्वैत सग्रहण तुल्य उभयो प्राज्ञ तुर्यो उभयो प्राज्ञ तुर्यो बीज निद्रायुत प्राज्ञ बीज निद्रायुत प्राज्ञ सा चुर्यन विद्य स्वप्न निद्रायुतावाद्यो स्वप्न निद्रायुतावाद्यो प्राज्ञस्वस्वन निद्रया प्राज्ञस्वस्वन निद्रया न निद्रा नवन न निद्रा नवन तुरीय पश्यति निश्चिता तुरीय पश्यति निश्चिता सो दिस इज वॉट वी हेड बीन डूइंग इन द पैस टू क्लासेस these are karikas composed by gaudapada acharya following the most important teaching of the upanishad that is the seventh mantra the ultimate reality about ourselves which is called the turiyam the fourth aspect so called fourth aspect of the self but we know that is the real aspect of the self that is the reality about the self now um, gaudapada acharya he reveals this teaching to us by comparing the four aspects of the self what are the four aspects of the self the waker the dreamer the sleeper and the fourth 
which is actually the real, uh, the real self, the one, the one consciousness which appears as um, the waker with the gross, uh, gross body, the interacting with the gross world, which appears as the dreamer in the subtle body, that means having dreams in the mind, which appears as the deep sleeper when the mind is shut down, interacting neither with the external world nor having dreams. But it is the one consciousness in and through all of them and independent of all of those three. And what Gaudapada Acharya said was, we can look at all of this, all of this means waker, dreamer and sleeper, all of this as a play of ignorance and error. Um, ignorance and error. What does that mean? It means... Just like a person mistakes, makes a mistake about a snake, you know, the seeing the rope, does not see it as a rope, but sees it as a snake by mistake, by error. That error about the snake is actually due to his ignorance of the reality, which is the rope. Not knowing the reality um, predisposes us. Those who are sitting on the edge, could you just move a little bit so that others can sit? So I do not see the rope as a rope. I know something is there, but I, instead of uh, identifying it as a rope, um, I think it's something there, not knowing it to be a rope, it's possible that I may mistake it to be a snake. If I knew it to be a rope, I wouldn't mistake it to be a snake at all. So ignorance about the rope predisposes us, um, increases the possibility that we'll mistake it for something other than a rope. So, ignorance leads to error. Um, in um, Sanskrit, avidya and brahma or adhyasa, ajnana and adhyasa, uh, ignorance and superimposition. Now, if you compare the four aspects of the self, the three appearances and the one reality, three appearances, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, the one reality, turiyam. If you compare them with respect to ignorance and error, you will find the waker, that's us right now. We have both ignorance and error. Remember, ignorance and error about what? Don't say about the rope and the snake. Here we are talking about, the rope and the snake is an example. Here we are talking about ignorance about our real nature. In terms of the Mandukya Upanishad, ignorance about Turiyam. You might say, now we don't have ignorance about Turiyam. We have read about it. We have finished the seventh mantra. Well, we know about it. We have read about it. We've got some information about it. But until you can honestly feel that I am the witness of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. I am unaffected by the waker, the dreamer and the deep sleeper. I'm not really the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. But I'm the one consciousness appearing in all of these ways. Until you can honestly say that, we, we cannot say we have really known ourselves as that. Knowledge about the Turiyam means, I am Turiyam. Can we honestly say that I know myself without any doubt that I am the Turiyam? Now I have no more problems. No, until we can say that, we have to say that we are in ignorance. Ignorance about our real nature. What is the real nature? The Turiyam. What's it like? Waker, what's it like? We know. Just, just look at ourselves, we know what it is like. But Turiyam, what is it like? You just have to look at. Come. You have to sort of fit in. Yeah. The Turiyam, what is it like? Seventh mantra. Go back and take a look at the seventh mantra. There's a detailed uh, description, mostly in negative terms, about what the Turiyam is like. We do not know that, and therefore we make a mistake thinking we are this body mind. We are this body mind. That's all that we know about ourselves. So, ignorance and error. The waker has both ignorance and error. Ignorance about our real nature, Asturium, and error, which is born of the ignorance. What is the error? A misperception, a misunderstanding, a miscomprehension about ourselves, about myself. What do I think when I think about myself? This. Yes. My, this, the history of this body-mind complex is my history. That's my biodata. So that's the error. 
just like not knowing the rope, we may mistake it to be a snake. Not knowing the thurium, we mistake it to be the waker. So ignorance and error are both present in the waker. When we fall asleep and dream, does the dreamer, the person you are in the dream, the person you are in the dream, um, in your dream, each dream, you are a person in there in your dream, usually you are there, that person, does that person know, know himself or herself to be the thurium? No. So ignorance is there and error is also there. So ignorance and error are both present in the dream state. The dreamer also has ignorance and error. Deep sleeper, the deep sleep state. In deep sleep, just think about our deep sleep experience. Do I know I am thurium? No, not at all. I don't know anything. At least the waker knows the waking world. The waker knows the waking world. The waker knows the body and mind. The dreamer at least experiences a dream. But what does the deep sleeper experience? Blankness. A nothingness. So the deep sleeper has error, uh, has ignorance, does not know anything. Does not know <coughs> oneself or the other. It certainly does not know that, that I am thurium or anything like that. Does the deep sleeper have error? No. no. There is no mistake. You can't fault the deep sleeper for um, committing a mistake. It's like somebody tells a lie. Does not tell the truth. Does not keep silent. But tells a lie. So that's like committing an error. Both these cases there are errors. But deep sleeper is like somebody who keeps quiet. Does not tell the truth. But does not tell a lie also. So there is no mistake there. In the deep sleep, pragya, that is, ignorance is there, but no error. And the thurium has neither ignorance nor error. About what? About oneself, yes. Don't mix it up with anything else. The, see the waker... Uh, I didn't know the answers to my physics questions and I gave wrong answers to my physics questions on a math, math paper. I, I um, made mistakes there. If I'm thurium, so I will ha I'll do very well. I will have no ignorance about math and I will con no, com commit no errors on my math exams. No, no, nothing like that. So thurium has neither ignorance nor error. Now, I'm sure it's clear to everybody, it's worth repeating, however. When we go through to this, kind, this kind of analysis, is meant to clear up things, but it can create its own confusion also. So, just to clear up things, when we speak about waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, thurium, remember, we are just talking about one, one person, just you. It sounds like a committee, I know. <laughs> like a panel discussion or something. But no, there is just you, just me. What is the waker after all? In this scheme of things, what is the waker? The waker is none other than the thurium which does not know itself, ignorance, and then mistakes itself, thurium mistakes itself to be body-mind. So then thurium itself, from the thurium's point of view, if you realize that I am the thurium, then from that point of view, you will have no error about yourself. You know that and this thing becomes very clear if you uh, think about an enlightened person, whom we might consider an enlightened person. The enlightened person will always know himself or herself to be the thurium, whenever it's possible to think, like the waking or the dream state, uh, dream stages. Yes. Swami Kim just said that it's the thurium that makes the mistake, but how can the thurium make the mistake? Because thurium merely Right. Yes, but thurium in association with the mind. The error, the ignorance is in the mind and the error will be in the mind and the knowledge will also come in the mind. What knowledge will it be? That I am thurium. Always am thurium. Was, am, will always be the thurium. So that's, the, that's enlightenment. So that enlightened person will not make a mistake about this. The enlightened person... See, right now, suppose an enlightened person is in the waking state. Is that enlightened person aware of the waker? Yes. yes. There will be a waking world, there will be a body, there will be a mind. 
The thin difference is the enlightened person will say or will at least know without the shadow of doubt, I am Thuriam, the witness consciousness, not this body and mind, which I am operating through right now. In our case, what happens is, Thuriam is just um, something that we read about or we don't even know anything about it. We just, we are very clear we are this much only. Waker and the waker's world, that's what we are. This is the difference. Um, basically, what is enlightenment? Gaudapada is saying, when you say I, the I, should, uh, instead of referring to the waker, it should refer to the Thuriam. That's all. That's what I have to say to the body and mind. So, yes, the body and mind appear and then disappear. They come and go. In dreams, you have another body and mind. In deep sleep, no experience of body and mind. But you are the Thuriam in every case. That will be the enlightened person's conviction. We'll be very clear about that. That's true even now. Even under the condition of ignorance, we still are Thuriam, but we don't see it that way. So, name and form creating this ignorance and error, basically. The body and mind, name and form, right? No, you cannot say body and mind is creating the error because body and mind will continue to appear for the enlightened person also, but it does not create error for the enlightened person. So, but he doesn't associate himself with that body and mind, right? Enlightened the enlightened person does not associate himself with that body and mind, so yes. That yes. No, but again, look at the language you're using. Body and mind are the creating ignorance. Body and mind do not create ignorance. If body and mind creates ignorance, then the enlightened person cannot have enlightenment because the enlightened person also, you know, Ramakrishna, there's a body. So does it have a, a ignorance there? No. Holy Mother, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, they, they have, there are bodies there. So the presence of the body does not create uh, uh, ignorance. The presence of the body does not create error. Ignorance creates error. Ignorance is in the mind, it creates error. Yes. Swamiji, what happens to an enlightened person in his dream or in his deep sleep? Is that not similar to our deep sleep or our dream? Yes and no. Remember, the yeah. enlightened person from the Enthurium point of view, there is no waking, dreaming or deep sleep. Or you can say, from Thurian point of view, is continuously awake. What changes is the waking, dreaming and sleeping that is at the level of the mind. That difference is very clear to the enlightened person. So when the mind falls asleep, it will be just like our deep sleep. When the mind starts, is awakens and starts thinking in waking or in dreaming, it will be just like our waking and dreaming with the exception that that mind will have the clarity that I am the witness, this, the witness of this mind. Even in the dream? Yes, it will continue. It will be available. That, that distinction will become so clear, it will become available. For a full-blown full, full blown enlightened person, Jivan Mukta, the person will never be caught again in, in the identification of body-mind. That difference will be very clear. All right. Um, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Now, Gaurapada introduced four pairs of terms to indicate this ignorance and error. <laughs> Keep this in mind, that the waker has ignorance and error, the dreamer has ignorance and error about oneself. The deep sleeper has only ignorance but no error. And Thuriam, from Thuriam point of view, no ignorance, no error. Now, Gaurapada introduced four pairs of terms, just as a matter of comparison, in order to... Um, elucidate this whole concept. Four pairs of names for what? For ignorance and error. Four dimensions, let's say. Four aspects of ignorance and error. The first pair is, he used it was Agrahanam Anyatha Grahanam, Sanskrit. What does it mean? Non-comprehension and mistake or miscomprehension, which is almost the same thing as ignorance and error. Agrahanam, literally grahanam means grasping. And anyatha grahanam means grasping wrongly. So, no understanding and misunderstanding. So, if you look at it that way, the waker, you can tell me yourself now, the waker has what? Does it have no understanding of the truth? Yes. And misunderstanding of the truth? Yes. yes. 
the dreamer no understanding of the truth yeah. no comprehension and miscomprehension also yes. you don't seem to be sure yes. 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 and then <laughs> the deep sleeper does it have comprehension of the truth no, no. It, ha- it has no comprehension of the truth but does it have a miscomprehension of the truth does it misunderstand something no because the faculty of understanding itself is not working in deep sleep. Just shut down. Turiyam, on the other hand, has neither uh, lack of comprehension nor miscomprehension. In Sanskrit, no agrahanam and no anyathagrahanam. This, the second pair of names which um, Gaudapada uses is cause and effect. Karana karyam. Karana karyam. For ignorance, he uses the word cause, karana, and for error, he uses the word effect, karyam. If we just again recall the snake and rope example, we'll understand what he's talking about. Clearly, the cause and the effect there are ignorance and error. The cause of the error, seeing the snake, was what? Ignorance. Was ignorance. So that that is that ignorance is the karanam, and the effect was seeing a snake. So that is the karyam. The error was the effect. Uh, Ignorance was the cause and the error was the effect. Now, cause and effect. Waker, according to Gaudapada's language, the waker is trapped by both cause and effect. The dreamer is trapped by both cause and effect. The deep sleeper is trapped only by cause, not by the effect. And the turiyam is beyond cause and effect. In Sanskrit they say karya karana vilakshana. Quite apart from cause and effect. This has very deep implications for religion and philosophy. All these things which you are discussing here, in terms of religion, you know what it will be. The cause is Ishvara, God. God plus the power of Maya is is regarded as the cause of the entire universe. In all religions, God is regarded as the creator of the universe. So, in um, Vedanta also, Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman means the ultimate reality Brahman with the power of Maya is the cause of the entire universe. But what we are talking about, Turiyam, is neither cause nor effect. The Nirguna Brahman, the pure consciousness, is neither cause nor effect. Many of you think, yeah, that sounds airy speculation. It's you we are talking about. (laughs) The pure consciousness, the witness which you are, is neither cause nor effect. From the Brahman point of view, or Turiyam point of view, it is, we are talking about something beyond God, beyond the conception of God. The third pair of names which he uses or suggests, Gaudapada, because he uses only one of these names. Uh, is Bija Ankura. Bija Ankura. Bija means seed. Ankura is sprout. He doesn't use the word Ankura actually. So the seed is ignorance and the error which comes out of that ignorance is the sprout. So for example, for example the waker has, is well equipped with both the seed and the sprout. Uh, the dreamer is well equipped with both the seed and the sprout. The seed is ignorance and the sprout is ignorance. Uh, the sprout is error. And the deep sleeper, tell me, has only the seed. ignorance, the seed, bijam. Uh, just look at our own experience. All this that we experience now, imagine... In deep sleep, it's all as if merged into darkness. Why am I saying merged? It's not really erased because it comes back. When you wake up, your whole life comes back. So can you think of deep sleep as a potential state where everything has sort of been thrust back into a, or compacted into a seed form which will sprout again as waking and dreaming? Your waking comes back as your waking. Your dreams come back as your dreams. Your whole personality comes back. So it's like a computer which has been switched off or in, is in a hibernation mode or something like that. So seed state. That's, that's our deep sleep. But the turiyam is free of both the seed 
and the sprout forever free it is not infected with either another very nice pair of names which he uses remember all these are names for ignorance and error Gaudapada uses a very suggestive pair of names and could be confusing because he uses the same words again sleep and dream but he means something else entirely he says ignorance is sleep and our waking is a dream our dream is a dream our deep sleep is just sleep so according to him the waker has both sleep and dream you see in our ordinary uh, language when we dream don't you first have to sleep you yeah, first have to be asleep then only you can dream right sleep and then dream yes daydreaming of course uh, yeah yes so you don't you're not uh, asleep but in normally in dreams you're asleep and then you're dreaming so the waker according to um, gaudapada has both sleep and dream here he is using the word sleep and dream in a philosophical sense in a metaphysical sense what is sleep according to gaudapada not falling up, uh, jumping into bed and for you know you know uh, sleeping uh, at night not that that's not what he means he means by sleep he means not knowing your real nature we are ignorant of, of our real nature that's sleep according to gaudapada if that is sleep then we who claim to be awake right now waking state gaudapada would say you are you are asleep and what is dream according to gaudapada error not only do you not know that you are brahman you are the pure consciousness the absolute but you also think that you are a limited body and mind this little person this little life that's all who i am that's what i think that's that's what gaudapada calls a dream so in our waking state do we have sleep and dream yes, yes. gaudapada would say that you are sleepers and you are dreamers mm-hmm. it's exactly the language used by the buddha the very word buddha means one who has woken up we'll see a v- beautiful verse gaudapada says that we are asleep under the spell of beginningless maya when the sentient being individual being jiva you when you awaken from the sleep of beginningless maya you awaken into your non dual nature that's called wake waking up so according to him our the ordinary waker who we are right now according to him you are sleeping and dreaming according to him the dreamer when we are we are asleep and dreaming according to him you are sleeping and dreaming according to him the deep sleeper is sleeping mm-hmm. yeah so this sleep and dream is a metaphysical uh, use of the word sleeping and dreaming according to gaudapada it has nothing to do with whether you are actually awake or sleeping or dozing or whatever whatever you are doing until you are enlightened according to gaudapada you are deep asleep. you are in deep sleep. you are you are asleep you are sleeping you are asleep to your real nature the word buddha means that one who has awakened to the truth hmm. somebody's phone is buzzing so one who has awakened to the truth that is the meaning of buddha he will actually gaudapada will use this term buddha one when one awakens prabuddha he will use that Sorry. yes did uh, gaudapada uh, use madhvamaka madhvamaka buddhism that's a huge huge question for at least one it will take a one and a half hours so to talk about it there, right? a lot of similarities yes so that's a huge question his question is did gaudapada was he did he use madhyamaka buddhism that is one school of buddhism and there is a huge controversy on how much um, gaudapada was influenced by buddhism so that is an uh, entirely different topic you will see in nikhilanji's book for example half of the introduction is taken up by nikhilanji who argues against the thesis that gaudapada was uh, was um, either a buddhist or heavily influenced See, heavily influenced in one sense that cannot be denied because a lot of the terms used by gaudapada um, are similar to the terms used by the mahayana buddhists now that could be 
easily explained because of the prevalence of Buddhist philosophy at that time, during Gaudapada's time. So in your culture at that time, if a particular terminology is prevalent in philosophy, and if you're doing philosophy, you would use that terminology. Even if you were attacking that philosophy, you'd still use that. That's something that was used by others also at that time. But Nikhilanji gives several very cogent arguments. There are two schools of thought. Uh, earlier, many people noticed this and immediately jumped to the conclusion, like Vidu Shekhar Bhattacharya and others, that Gaudapada must have been a Buddhist. But it doesn't stand to reason. After all, first of all, he's commenting on the Upanishad, which is clearly a Hindu text. Why would a Buddhist ever do that? You're talking about an ultimate reality beyond the changing, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. That doesn't sound very Buddhist. So there are different, many different reasons why it's not, uh, it's not very rational to argue that Gaudapada was a Buddhist. But one can argue about how much influence Buddhism had on him. One traditional monk, because, because of Gaudapada's influence, again Shankaracharya has been uh, charged with being a crypto-Buddhist, Prachanna Buddha. Crypto-Buddhist, a hidden Buddhist, by the dualists, the Hindu dualists who charge the non-dualists of being hidden Buddhists. Uh, I heard one traditional monk, uh, non-dualist monk, Hindu monk in uh, north of India, he reversed it. He said, no, I would rather say the Buddhists are hidden Vedantins. <laughs> On what grounds? On what grounds? The gro on the grounds that uh, the Upanishads predate the Buddha. Okay. Upanishads clearly, Manduka Upanishads and all, they were clearly before the Buddha. So if there is any similarity, then we must say Buddha took it from the Upanishads, not the other way around. And by the way, that was more or less uh, Swami Vivekananda's understanding. Very interesting. Uh, he said, this philosophy of non-dualism has saved religion, has saved India uh, thrice. Uh, the ancient religion of India has been saved thrice. The, the, I think he says India has been saved thrice. Once he said uh, at the time of the uh, at the time of Buddha, which means he is identifying Buddha with the teaching of non-dualism. And the second time he said by Shankara, and third time of course he meant Sri Ramakrishna and himself. So um, he clearly thought Buddhist teaching was. In a sense, Vedantic, though not in form, not at all in form. And I would tend to agree. And there are a number of scholars who tend to see the similarity there. Yes. Swamiji, what's the difference between uh, Nidra and Yoga Nidra? I think it relates to the question she asked before. Uh, who asked? Yoga Nidra. What's the difference between, this is sleep is the Nidra. Hmm. What yoga nidra are you talking about? That's the word we hear. There is a yoga nidra which is used in Hatha Yoga, which is a relaxation exercise. Nothing particularly philosophical about it. It also comes from the chanting, right? Yes. That, in the, that has a deeper meaning. That yoga nidra would probably refer to the pralaya state. But that has no, no bearing on this. Those terms do not enter here. Right. Remember, the Mandukya is, is very um, direct. It talks to your experience. Whether Vishnu is in Yoga Nidra, at the dissolution of the universe, lying on his couch of the thousand-hooded serpent, that's all magnificent uh, you know, mythology and a, a beautiful belief system. But what does it have to do with you? <laughs> a strict non-dualist would say, what are you talking about? <laughs> here, what we are talking about is always absolutely clear. No mysticism here. It's something that everyone can and should relate to. Not a system of belief. Not a system of theology. Not even a, philo not even a philosophy. This is, Vedanta is regarded as a system of philosophy, but if you have a deeper understanding of Advaita Vedanta, this one, it's always talking about Fact, experience, and reason based on experience. Yeah. Yes. Wait, I'll come to you. Swami, you are learning that we are the Surya. We don't really know we are that. That's huh. something we hope one day that we will realize that. But you could probably learn a lot from 
looking at realized souls who actually did realize that they are material. Yes. Right? And so my question is, if one, one studies those who were we know realized, and there are probably many around even today, uh, what happens to them? Do they have emotions? Do they feel pleasure and pain? And why don't they give up the body once they know that they are the Turiyam? Why do they continue to right. live in this body? When you realize you're the Turiyam, what do you actually realize? You realize, I am the one consciousness in everybody. Not only that, you realize everybody is the Turiyam. They are. Only this mind knows it, the minds there do not know it, that's the difference they, they will feel. But the fact is that we are that one reality and we are all one in that reality. Now your question is, do they have emotions, feelings? Quite obviously. Sure. First of all, you just look at, in two ways I'll answer that. As you said, one very good way, whenever you have doubts, is just look at the lives, the behavior and the speech of those you, you consider to be enlightened. How do they act in this world? Do they seem to have emotion? Very much so. Look at it from this philosophical point of view. Where is emotion? Mind. mind. When you realize you are the Thurium, is the mind disturbed by any... Uh, do you make any change in the mind? Except the knowledge comes that you are Thurium. Will uh, the mind continue to function? W will the body continue to function? Yes. Will the body feel hungry? Will you eat food? Will it digest food? Yes. No. Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. Yes. Good yes. Very good, sir. It will, it will continue to function as usual. In, in that case, why shouldn't the mind continue to function as usual? Will the mind think? Yes. Will the mind remember? Will, or will memory fail completely after thurium? That is not very attractive then. I have realized I am the thurium. Then I have a bad case of amnesia now. No. So all the functions of the world. Remember, jnana does not destroy anything in the world. Nothing here in the world will be destroyed when you become enlightened. Nothing here also will be destroyed. The only thing that jnana, knowledge destroys is ignorance. 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 Yes. You're all good Vedantins now. So <laughs> only thing, Forceful. the only difference that um, knowledge will make to the enlightened person will make to you is that your ignorance that you are not the Turiyam. That ignorance will go away. Only that much. Nothing else. And that itself is an enormous thing, actually. <laughs> so, Swami, isn't it the case that you realize that all this is a projection and it's all Maya? So yes. So why, why bother? Why not? Like, it is not real. The only thing real is the Turiya. You know you yes. the Turiya. Why bother with the rest of it? For such a soul. Ah. In, but uh, can, you, can I not put it the other way around? What rest of it? Why exist in the body-mind complex that you are? Oh, then a full-blown realization will be what is the body-mind complex other than Thurium? It's a projection. Yeah, and the projection is what actually? When, when you realize the, uh, um, the necklace is gold, through and through, every bit of it is gold. Gold is the only reality. Now you're asking why bother with the necklace? With the necklace exactly. But the necklace is gold. My question will be why would you want to change it? You have realized its real nature. I'll come to you. You have realized its real nature that it is gold. That every ornament is gold. Now would you want to change one ornament or another? Now I have realized that the necklace is gold. Let me melt it down into a lump of gold. No. No, no, no problem at all. You have no problems with it being nec a necklace or a bracelet or a lump of gold. You want to respond to this one? Yeah. Right. So, you will, you will not feel, actually an enlightened person would not feel like meddling with the, uh, with the body, mind or the flow of the world. Whatever impulse comes up in the mind. Remember, the mind has already been purified by a long process of spiritual practice. So, usually it will be a noble mind, a mind of a sage. So, noble impulses will come up in that mind. And the person who has realized that I am Thurium will continue to work through that and exercise those noble impulses, might spend a life working for the welfare of others. Always look at the, the examples of enlightened persons. Will that person work for the welfare of others? Will that person necessarily establish schools and hospitals? May not be. Might sit in a cave like uh, Raman Maharshi. Might give up the body like Pavari Bhava who entered into the fire. 
there's a story of pavari baba actually you know how he he, he passed away he gave up the body now what motivates such a sage to do something or the other be it's a mystery it's beyond our understanding because that person no longer sees himself as one individual so the desire to interfere with one individual in fact that is supposed to be a sign of a little bit of ignorance remaining the desire to make big changes in one life as you step back from a ordinary person's life ramakrishna himself today itself we are reading i think in the morning swami subodhananda who was a disciple of sri ramakrishna he was he was child like khoka maharaj so at the end of sri ramakrishna's life during his the worst period of his illness subodhananda goes to khoka uh, to sri ramakrishna and says i really believe if you would only will it so your disease will be cured and sri ramakrishna was happy to say do you really believe that he says yes you just say that your disease will be cured i am sure it will be cured and sri ramakrishna was very happy to hear that and he said you are right i also know that but i will not i'm not going to do it we our point of view would be that would be a great thing you know i by way she would do it <laughs> or is he just evading the thing but look at it try just once to look at it from that person's point of view it's a little puddle of chemicals here to think that i the infinite consciousness behind all living beings forever an immortal being would come down again to make this little puddle of existence live a little longer this itself shows ignorance that as uh, why am i so attached to this little thing when he wanted to eat somebody said that um, i want you to eat with this mouth pray to the divine mother for that the divine mother told him what you are eating in so many mouths why do you want to eat through this mouth But imagine for from our point of view this sounds nice but just try to imagine it suppose it's true and imagine it from his point of view so you would not try to do that yeah. there were two question one question here and come here i'll come here yeah you know, just to uh, clear up what is ignorance is it uh, like the you know when you remove ignorance is it like the right ego and the unright ego or that's not the comparison no that's there but let's take it in a very simple way I did not know that I am this infinite consciousness unlimited consciousness and therefore I thought I was this body and mind now I know that's the going away of the ignorance ignorance means what it stands the word literally means not knowing and therefore leading to error ripe ego unripe ego when sri ramakrishna talks about it unripe ego is the ego in the mind of the waker who does not who is under ignorance and error and therefore the unripe ego thinks i am this body and mind this is my house my husband wife my children this is mine and th- that is not mine this will be mine next and that i will get rid of next so this is the thinking of the unripe ego the ripe ego is what is the ego functioning in the mind of the enlightened person the enlightened person now knows i am the infinite consciousness but the body is still there at least it appears and the mind is still there it appears in the mind and ego will also appear that ego now remains as the ripe ego what will that ego say sri ramakrishna put it in two ways so that ego if it if it's a devotee a person who is devotional who has deep faith in god has realized god from that that person will continue will continue as i am the child of the lord i am the servant of the lord thou art my master i am thy servant that will be the ripe ego of the enlightened person or in this perspective sri so ramakrishna also says this that the ripe ego will continue as i am turiyam he says it will continue as i am the pure consciousness the ego ego will refer back to that pure consciousness okay i'll come to you i have a, a question on the clarification of terms when you use the term god do you always mean sarvaguna brahmana or do you sometimes include nirguna brahman in term god because also when you say buddhists or jains don't believe in god hmm. which, which which brahman are you talking about yeah so in vedanta these terms i was just thinking today in suppose something like god in most philosophies in most theologies 
it is vague, mysterious, uh, ambiguous. In Vedanta, it is absolutely precise. There is no way of uh, misusing these terms. English word God is very ambiguous. It can refer to uh, God knows what it means. <laughs> In Vedanta, very precise. It always means Saguna Brahman. What is Saguna Brahman? That also has a very precise definition. That's why Vedanta Sar is so useful. Like a primer of Vedanta. We have started off with uh, at the top of Mount Everest. That's why these questions keep coming up. If you start off with Vedanta Sar, instead of Mandukya Karika, you start off at the base camp. So... There will be no, I mean the question will not come up at all. What, is, what do you mean by Saguna Brahman? Clear definition. Maya upahita chaitanyam. Consciousness associated with Maya. What is Maya? That's also clearly defined. In one sense at least. It is samashti agyanam. The ignorance of all of us combined together. So, consciousness plus Maya is Saguna Brahman in Vedanta. Now that Saguna Brahman can be understood at three levels, which is consciousness and the um, and Maya itself, which is called Ishvara at this level, at the causal level. Co- this uh, Saguna Brahman is uh, that Ishvara plus the cosmic mind, it becomes Hiranyagarbha at the subtle level, plus the cos- entire physical cosmos, one consciousness identified with the entire universe, with all our minds and with the entire universe, that is called Virat. It comes at this level. All precisely defined. I mean, uh, um, there's actually no scope of making an er- error there. And you have to be at every step clear about what you're talking about. I was just, in fact, I was just thinking, in comparison to other religious philosophies, both inside Hinduism and outside, um, they, they, this conception of God, whether you agree with it or not, at least the terms are very clearly defined. There is no scope for confusion. You approach any other theology and in any other religion, you will be thrown with, into a mass of mystery and vagueness and ambiguity. Yeah. We don't know what you are talking about really. Alright, um, I will come to you. I understand ignorance and error. What is Gaurapad trying to achieve by doing these four concepts, which I actually find a little bit more confusing? He's supposed to, he's trying to clear up the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Cause and effect, for example, it, it automatically brings the law of karma in my mind. Yeah. Is, has it got anything to do with law of karma? Or True. Um, the, the cause and effect uh, is at this level, at the law of karma. They, they are all bound by the law of karma, definitely. Before I go there, one more point. The Jainas and the Buddhists, therefore, do not believe in this kind of God. Which kind of God? Any kind of God. The, the cosmic uh, idea that there is one consciousness associated with all of it. That's why you will find Jainism and Buddhism are very individualistic. Even the conception of Buddha is of an individual. It's not something behind the entire universe, associated with the entirety. So, the, the, the Jina, the highest conception in Jainism is of, of a perfected being, not somebody who is identified with the entire cosmos. In the basic idea of God is a totality in Vedanta. All of it, consciousness associated with all of it. All of what? All would, what would all mean here? The entire um, gross universe, the entire subtle universe and the entire causal universe. That's what's meant by all of it. That's One, Turiya, right? That's, that's... Mm-hmm. Turiya is beyond. Just, we just yeah, said that. Yeah. Turiya is beyond all of them. But isn't, isn't all of this really Brahman? Because that is uh, it's the projection of it. Ah. It is that. It is yes. But look at the word you used. Really. Really it is Brahman. At this level it is false. It's not that there are four. There is only one. If you realize the Turiyam, it's only Turiyam and all Turiyam. And all of this continues as a false appearance. But, if you come back to this level of appearance, then there is cause and effect. Then there is individual and total. 
If you take the individual, there's an individual waker, there is an individual dreamer and an individual sleeper, you. If you take it at the cosmic level, there is a consciousness associated with the entire cosmos in the waking world, with the entire cosmos in the thought world and the entire cosmos in the causal world. That is called God. All of these are the level of appearance. And what is Nishtika? Uh, oh, Nastika. 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 All right. So, um, no, but let's uh, slow, move slowly. Uh, I always I impose speed limits because we have <laughs> thoughts going all over the place. <laughs> About 5,000 years of Indian philosophy is <laughs> cruising all over the place. That way lies madness. <laughs> we move slowly, move carefully. So, this thing that there is a consciousness associated with the entire universe whom you call God, whom the individual can worship. What is our idea of God? Consciousness with the power which produces the entire universe is omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, is the creator, preserver, destroyer of the universe. This is the idea of God found in theistic religions. Are you with me? Such a God Buddhism does not believe in. Such a God Buddhism does not believe in. Or Jainism. Or in Hinduism, Sankhya. Yoga. Yoga believes in Ishwara. But the Ishwara of Yoga is a Purusha Vishesha. Is a special, is a perfected being. But not the creator of the universe. Not the master of Prakriti. Not the Muslims. Hmm? Not the Muslims. They don't believe. Of course they do. The, the Abrahamic religions are all theistic. My God, what are you talking about? <laughs> they don't, oh, ideal, uh, ideal, ideal worship. Right? No, so all right, absolute <laughs> time out. <laughs> Remember, we are talking about something. You, uh, this is the pull of gravity, pulling you down to... First to philosophy, then to religion, then to science, and back to the earth again. <laughs> we are far, far above belief systems and religions here. Stick to experience. Stick to reason. Mm. Yes. So, I come to you. Swamiji, that means, according to Vedanta, um, God is beyond Saguna Brahman also. Uh, sorry, uh, it's... Uh, Surya is beyond God. Right. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. One mm. step back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So in uh, Advaita Vedanta, like yeah. we talk uh, initially about that body mind is separate from the Brahmin himself. Mm. Not Brahmin. Brahman. 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 Yeah. Mm. Brahman is a caste. Uh, yeah. mm. No, the Brahman himself. Yeah. And later on, we say the body mind itself is a Brahman. Uh, it is not other than Brahman. Yes. Not other than Brahman. So if everything is Brahman, hmm. and what they what Brahman creates himself is also Brahman, hmm. then if ignorance is also Brahman, then hmm. why go fight against it? Why don't accept it hmm. that that's also Brahman? Um, just be with it. Yeah. Would anybody care to answer? Yes. Hi. Yes. yes. So the goal of everything that we do is to give us happiness and peace. Mm. And so staying in that state of ignorance that he's speaking about is not going to get us to happiness. And that is true. If you say, why, why not remain in ignorance, it will, that will, will make you unhappy. You cannot remain in ignorance. That it'll, it'll drive you back to the Vedanta class again. But, <laughs> but wait, wait. No more questions now. Time out. But I'll just respond to that. It is something that I have mentioned again and again in the Parokshanabhuti class, in the Drik Drishya Vive class, in numerous classes. Vedanta has two stages. Vedanta has two stages, Advaita Vedanta. The first stage is a search for the reality. To, to search for the reality, you must step back from the appearance. So, if there is such a thing as Zathuriyam or Atman or Brahman, then we must know it apart from the world, body and mind. Why? Because right now, I am under the influence of not only ignorance, but error, which convinces me I am the body-mind. So I must know myself as apart from body and mind. That I am not the body, not the mind. In the Nirvana Shatakam and Shankaracharya, 
Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. He says, I am of the nature of Shiva. But before that, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego, and I am not the prana, I am not the panchakosha, and so on. I am not this neti, 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 and finally realizes. But that's just the first step of Advaita. These are fundamental things. You must always remember this. This is the first step of Advaita. Second step is, all that you said, I am not this and I am not that. What about those things? What are they in relation to you, the Brahman? Once you realize, I am Brahman, I am Satchidananda, I am pure consciousness, Turiyam, whatever. Then what is all this? What is all this? That question remains. Don't be so quick to answer it. That question remains. And the answer given by Vedanta is, those things are appearances of the same Turiyam. They are nothing other than Turiyam. But, remember, they are not real in themselves. Without Turiyam, they could not exist. They would neither exist nor appear. It's the examples which I gave, just use those examples. The gold and the ornament. To realize the you know, reality. You have necklaces, you have bracelets, you have rings. Somebody tells you these are not real, the reality is gold. Then you must realize first of all, it's not this necklace, it's not the ring, it's not the bracelet which is real. Apart from them, there is something called gold, which is the real thing. Having realized that, now you realize that the necklace is nothing but that gold. The bracelet is nothing but that gold. The ring is nothing but that gold. Having realized that also, you must be very clear. It's not that there are two realities now. Gold and necklace. There is only gold. Not a, No such thing separately as a necklace. The necklace is a name and a form and a function given to the reality called gold. Similarly, Maya means name, form and function. This entire universe is name, form and function, but the reality is Brahman. That's what is being, uh, that's what is being claimed and by Advaita Vedanta. So you must realize that. So I thought his question was, why should we, why can't we remain in the state of ignorance? Yeah, so that, the answer, answer is there, that we, you cannot remain in the state of ignorance because it's a state of suffering. The suffering itself will drive you to knowledge. But I'm answering the first part of his question. That uh, you, you noticed that we are saying we are not this. And then when you're saying that all of this is also Brahman. If all of this is Brahman, if all of this is Brahman, all the teachers would say straight away, when you start searching for the ultimate truth, the teachers would say, this is the ultimate truth. Disastrous teaching. Uh, but one, um, this is called iti. This is the truth. And it's right. If you show a necklace and say... What is gold? If you say straight away, this is gold. What will the person who does not recognize gold, what will that person think? Necklace. The necklace is the gold. The moment the necklace is melted into and made into a ring, he'll think gold is gone. <laughs> Do you see? So first he must, that confusion must be removed. That name and the form and the function is not gold. The substance is gold. That has to be pointed out. That has to be realized. That is realized by the process of neti neti, not this, not this. One must realize the ultimate reality and then see everything is a manifestation of that reality. If you do not realize the ultimate reality and say, this is the ultimate reality, uh, one uh, Swami said, anybody who gives such a teaching murders the disciple. Murders the disciple means? Murders the spiritual future of the disciple. We are already materialists. You are just confirming me in my materialism. If you say, this is the reality. Then why do I need Vedanta or Buddhism or anything else? No questions. All right, let us go ahead. I'm sorry, we'll have questions at the end. Let's make some progress. Some beautiful karikas are coming now. Karika number 15. Anyatha grinhata swapno, Anyatha grinhata swapno, Nidra tatvam ajanatam, Nidra tatvam ajanatam, Vipar yase tayokshine, Vipar yase tayokshine, Turiyam padamashnute, 
Turiyam padam ashnute. Dream belongs to one who sees falsely and sleep to one who does not know reality. When the two errors of these two are removed, one attains the state that is Turiyam. How does one become established in the Turiyam? The answer given by Gaudapada gives the answer here. What is dream according to him? Seeing wrongly is dream. Not falling asleep and dreaming something. We just de- defined the philosophical meaning of sleep and dream according to Gaudapada. What is the philosophical meaning of sleep according to Gaudapada? Ignorance. Ignorance. Whether you are wide awake in this world, you are still asleep unless you are enlightened. So ignorance of your real nature as Turiyam is sleep. And what is dream according to Gaudapada? False. False. False notions about oneself. That I am the body and mind. So that is, that is dream. Anyatha grinhata swapna. Swapna means dream. Dream is misperception. Misperception of the reality. Wrong comprehension of the reality. What is misperception of the reality? According to Gaurapada, does not know that I am Satchidananda and thinks that I am body and mind. This is dream. And all the associated problems. I am old or I have disease and nobody cares for me or this is my house and my property and my um, uh, husband, wife, children and their problems are also my problems. This is all because of identification with one body mind. This is called dream. You are in a dream. And then what is sleep in that case? Nidra tattvam majanata. Not knowing the reality is sleep. That you are Satchidananda, not knowing that is sleep. Now, how does one, and who is affected by the uh, by these? Um, the waker and the dreamer and the deep sleeper are all affected by sleep, ignorance. And the waker and the dreamer are affected by dreaming, that the misconception. Now, only the Turiyam is free of all of these. How does one become the Turiyam? Your answer will be, we are the Turiyam. So all that you need to do is to realize, to recognize, to realize, to grasp, to understand the truth that we are the Turiyam. And how does that one, have, one, do, one do that? Viparya se tayokshine. When the dream, when the sleep of ignorance and the dream of error are removed, then one, one is Turiyam. When one is free of these two, uh, these two faults. What are the two faults? One fault is the sleep of ignorance and the consequent fault is the dream of error. When these two faults are removed, when these two are removed, one realizes one is Turiyam. How do you remove them then? By knowledge. By knowledge. So, knowledge of what? Knowledge of my real self, that I am Turiyam. Remember one thing. That which is removed by knowledge never existed. That is true. I am being um, chased by, or, or, or a burglar has broken into the house and uh, I am in terror and anxiety. And suddenly a snap awake sitting on the bed and you realize it was a nightmare. You have awakened from the nightmare. Then what happened to the burglar? Never was there. Removed. Was removed by? The burglars was removed by? Awakening. Waking up from the dream, from the nightmare. But that burglar which was removed by waking up, what does, was that burglar ever there? No. Did you have to dial 911? Did the police come? No. It was removed by waking up only because it was never there. So knowledge removes, if knowledge removes anything, it removes that which was never there. And if knowledge gives you anything, it always gives you that which was already there. What you already had, knowledge gives you that. What you never had, knowledge takes that away. Nice result, result, yes. Sounds like a con job. (laughs) (laughs) Knowledge tells you that you are Turiyam, only because knowledge does not make you Turiyam. Only because you are already Turiyam, knowledge just reveals that to you. All right.
So that's a verse. And because of ignorance, this sleep, and then the consequent dream, that is the cause of our samsara. Now you might have a question. At this point, everybody has the question. So the whole thing boils down to our ignorance of the fact that I am Turiyam. This question will always come again and again. Where did this ignorance come from? When did this ignorance start? Yeah. Why are we under this ignorance now? You know, the Vedantic reasoning goes like this. Um, so why do I have this life now? Step by step. Why do I have this life now? In a very commonsensical way, the approach is this. Where Vedanta will say, because of the results of your karma. Because of what you did, you are getting these experiences. These parents, this body, this life, these companions, these uh, experiences, both good and bad, because of your past karma. So why did I do this past karma? Why did I do karma at all? Because of desire. I want I want these things and I want to avoid those things. Raga, Dvesha. Liking and disliking. We are prompted to effort by our impulses, which push us towards certain things and drive us away from other things. So I want wealth, I want health, I want um, be, to be successful. Nothing wrong with all of this. And I want to drive away ill health and um, you know, misery and poverty and death. And therefore I do karma. I work. And because of that work, the results come. So our life right now is, a, is the result of my own karma. My karma is the result of my desires. Why did I have those desires at all? Because the root of all desires is ignorance. Ignorance of what? Of your own infinite nature. If you knew what you are, then you would not have these desires to get something from the world. You would be perfectly alright with everything. Because you are that infinite, untouched infinite. So ignorance is at the root. Shankaracharya uses the phrase again and again. Avidya kama karma. Avidya kama karma. Ignorance, desire, karma, work. And the rest is self-explanatory. Karma will give results and that will propel you from life to life to life and so on. So the root of everything is in ignorance. Now if, if you're asked, where did this ignorance come from? Past lives? Immediately your question will be, when did it start? <laughs> Where did it start? And who is responsible for it? Is God responsible for it? So all these questions come up. And the answer is in the next, very next verse. <laughs> yes. Do Don't be too excited. It's going to be, <laughs> going to be a real downer next. <laughs> it's a very beautiful verse. It's uh, one of my b favorite karikas in the whole book. Anadi mayaya supto Anadi mayaya supto Yada jiva prabudhyate Yada jiva prabudhyate Ajam anidram asvapnam Ajam anidram asvapnam Advaitam buddhya te tada Advaitam buddhya te tada Very beautiful verse. It says, when, when you, the individual being, the sentient being, jiva, when you awaken, look at the word prabudhyate, the word buddha is to awaken. When the in, individual being awakens, not from a nap, but from Suptaha, the deep sleep of ignorance. What ignorance? Anadi Maya, beginningless Maya. Then what does the person awaken into? What do you awaken into? Into Advaitam, the non-dual reality. Ajam, the unborn reality, which does not, which is not born like the physical body, which means it does not undergo the changes and the death of the physical, like the physical body. Anidram, which is beyond ignorance, beyond sleep. Pure consciousness never sleeps. It is beyond ignorance about itself. And in fact, it's beyond our physical sleep also. Because it's, it's always awake. It's the witness of our sleep. Anidram. And it's, here also it means beyond ignorance. Aswapnam. Beyond error. 
Literally, it means beyond sleep and beyond dream. Is it beyond knowledge? Beyond knowledge, yes. Uh, the two answers. Yeah. Very clearly. And, and you should be... Now I'll ask you ex uh, to explain what I am saying. Your question is, is it beyond knowledge? My answer is, yes, it's beyond knowledge. Two, it is knowledge itself. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? Then the question will arise, what is knowledge in Advaita Vedanta? What is the role played by Turiyam in knowledge in Advaita Vedanta? And what is Turiyam itself? Hold on. <laughs> Hold that question. But now let's, let's, uh, ex let's uh, dwell on this, uh, uh, this very important and beautiful verse. No, one thing is, the questions are, they are, they are very valid questions. But uh, my point is, these are also very basic questions. One must clear up these things. Uh, it requires the basic groundwork of Advaita to clear up these things. I'll, I'll come back. Hold on to the question. I'll come back to it. Um, but le let's first look at this verse. What was the question we raised? Where does ignorance come from? When did ignorance come? Who or what is responsible for this ignorance? What caused this ignorance? Or, uh, this, so that's the question. What, what, when did Maya come? Don't say Maya is responsible. We're asking, we are we're going further. We're asking who is responsible for Maya. It's the nature of the Turiyam. Is Turiyam responsible? Then I, I, then, then I really hate Turiyam because it's... <laughs> materialism? If it's always been there, so it, did, did it ever start? No, no, no. It didn't start. That's what he's saying. His answer is, un, look at this word, look at this word. Anadi Maya Yasupta. In this one word, he has answered all those questions. And his answer is, the questions are wrong. Is the questions are wrong. You are assuming it is something that began. But ignorance is not something that begins. In fact, this is a professor uh, J.N. Mahanti in a, in a lecture in, in the Institute of Culture in Gold Park. He pointed out something interesting. If you are asking a question, when did ignorance begin? And the answer given by Vedanta it is, is that it is beginning less. We, get, we are not satisfied. We think that, oh, they are evading it. And they, are, they should give us an answer, but they are not giving us an answer. They are evading it. But that is not true. In fact, forget Vedanta. Any kind of ignorance, in the worldly sense also... Any kind of ignorance is beginningless. Suppose I don't know Spanish. Actually, just today I was um, coming out of the subway and a gentleman came and uh, asked me. Uh, I was walking near the subway, near the park. A gentleman came out and asked me, do you speak Spanish? I said, no, I'm not Latino, I'm Indian. But then I got hold of him and took him to somebody who did speak Spanish. He wanted directions. So I don't know Spanish. I have ignorance of Spanish. When did my ignorance of Spanish start? If I say that my ignorance started, if you ask the question, since when did you not know, do you not know Spanish? Uh, usually the answer is, you are all philosophically acute per people, so you will not make those mistakes. But an unwary audience, somebody is bound to say, well, from my very birth. So does that mean before your birth you knew Spanish? <laughs> you never knew Spanish. The, your ignorance, my ignorance of Spanish is without beginning. But it has an end. It has an end. The moment I take lessons in Spanish, my ignorance of Spanish comes to an end. So, ignorance is always without be beginningless. Ignorance has no cause. So, the we think the who started ignorance, where did it start and when did it start, all the questions are meaningless because ignorance is anadi maya, beginningless maya. Asleep because of beginningless maya. Anadi maya ya supta. Very, very poetic. Look at the verse. We, individual beings, sleeping since beginningless time because of this beginningless ignorance. When we awaken. This beginningless ignorance about Spanish has an end the moment I start attending Spanish classes. The beginningless ignorance about our self, Turiya, has an end the moment you start attending Vedanta classes, yes. It'll, hopefully it will come to an end. So, 
इट एज एन एंड यदा जीव प्रबुद्ध्य थे वेरी सोरिंग इंस्पायरिंग पॉजिटिव वर्ड्स वेन यू अवेकन वेन यू रियली अवेकन अवेकन प्रबुद्ध्य थे जिस नॉट जस्ट वेकिंग अप रियली अवेकनिंग बिकम एनलाइटन दिस इज दिस इज द सेम टोन इन विच विवेकानंद से इज अराइज अवेक एंड स्लीप नॉट Uh, till the and stop not till the goal is reached uh, it, this is he has taken it from another upanishad uttishtata jagrata prapya varan nibodhata um it's in the in the upanishad it means in the original quotation it means arise from the beginningless sleep of maya awaken to your non dual reality your infinite nature uh, uh, find out those blessed ones who are enlightened and realize the truth from them prapya varan nibodha that vivekananda adapted into arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached that's also a very good adaptation in the same way in gorapada says when you awaken to your um, real nature and what is that real nature he mentions advaitam non non dual non dual very profound i just make one point here if upon awakening if upon getting knowledge i realize my real nature is non dual then what happens to the world of duality what is this world of duality then it has to be false the entire universe is falsified it doesn't disappear it is falsified when you realize that your true nature is non dual what does it mean to say turiya is non dual oh okay turiya is non dual but what about my world you have not understood what is meant by turiya being non dual turiya being non dual means there is no second thing apart from turiya there is no second reality apart from turiya even when we say you ask the question you see the the movement is so subtle even when we say oh we realize everything is turiya no 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 there is no everything <laughs> there is only turiyam yes then what is all this an appearance a mirage a falsity is it true to say all is turiyam yes only know that all is not turiyam alone is vivekananda had this nice exchange of poems let uh, you know uh, a back and forth with with his disciple mary hale was a young american woman who was uh, um, was close a follower of vivekananda and she wrote a poem to vivekananda saying that i have understood what you have taught it's in vivekananda's collected poems so i have understood what you have taught that you have taught us that all is god and he wrote back saying that i never said such thing unmeaning talk it's a strange doctrine that all is god i have never taught such thing and she wrote back saying that this is exactly what you said i'm repeating what you said you said all is god he said no i i said god only is all is not i never said everything is god there is a big difference between the two god only is everything else is not or everything is not it is all it's an appearance if you say everything is god it's like there are two things god and everything and god somehow pervades everything is fills up everything if you if you go closer i mean if you, if you examine the language if i say all the ornaments are gold is it correct more precise to say there are no ornaments there is only gold yeah. yes that is the result of it's the <laughs> kind of crazy talk you'll start using when you read uh, mandukya upanishad everybody will tell you but there are ornaments what's all this in front of you you will immediately say show me the ornaments without the gold <laughs> where is the thing that you call an ornament touch it you'll touch gold bring it to me you'll bring gold only weigh it you'll weigh the gold only where is the thing called an ornament there's no thing called an ornament the only thing is the gold the similarly the only thing is the turiyam advaitam conclusion 1 if knowledge reveals advaitam then the dvaitam must be false it must be a false appearance i'll come to you you had a question i mean my question was why does it have to be such a grand view that there is ignorance and there is a grand hmm. so we are constantly creating our own ignorance because 
because of the rag and wave. <coughs> and if so, the moment you realize that there is rag and wave, hmm. that means in a little way you are <coughs> you're, you're stopping the cycle of construction of further ignorance. So in small things, there can be um, you know alleviation of ignorance. All right. What you are saying is relevant for sadhana. Start with small things. Try to control your strong likes and dis dislikes, passions, reduce it. But what this is doing is going to the root of the problem. If you can continue to consider yourself, if I say that I am this little creature of flesh and blood. I am born, I am this body, this mind and somehow... To be a nice religious person, I have to control my raga, dvesha, my likes and dislikes. So maybe I will try to bring my likes and dislikes under control. But as long as I have a deep sense that I am a limited biological creature born to perish tomorrow, subject to a hundred threats from this world. Uh, there are financial problems, there are relationship problems, there are health problems and all of those are true. I cannot but ultimately have raga and dvesha. You may make mild adjustments. You may become from a less disciplined person to a little more disciplined person. From a less controlled person to a more controlled person. But still you are a samsari jiva. Subject to birth and death, subject to the terrors of life, you can never overcome suffering. Unless you go to the root. And the root is, what am I really? It, you have to go to the root. That's why it becomes such a grand vision. You have to go to the root. Ultimately, when you go to the root, you have to go to the root of your experience. What do you experience? Your experience is grand. I and universe. So the answer has to encompass I and the universe also. And this answer is very simple here, but very grand. There is one reality which appears as the I and the universe of this I. That is Turiyam. Do you see where I am going with this? Advaita goes to the very root. It does not believe in band-aids. <coughs> Hmm. You must solve the problem uh, at, at, at the source. If the source is ignorance, not the little ignorance at the level of uh, I like chocolate chip cookies or I like uh, um, uh, caramel cookies or whatever. Uh, sugar is not good for me. And uh, what is good for me? Gluten-free. <laughs> what? <laughs> Gluten-free is good for me. That is a nice adjustment to make. But that will, that, that has, uh, I mean, it's comical in the face of this. If this, if the problem runs so deep, how can you solve anything? But you can so solve the karma part of it, right? Where we're you will continue, you, will, you can solve it means what? You can, instead of generating negative karma, you can generate a lot of good karma. Good karma. Yes, that is again, remember, that kind of thinking, is, it's there in, in, in Vedanta. It, it's, it's called, the, it's basically it's called dharma, the level of thinking of the dharma. Generate a better life for yourself. Prevent yourself from suffering. If that is your thinking, then you have to go through that kind of process for many, many lives till you get tired of that also. Only after that you turn to this. But Swami, I mean, getting enlightenment, I mean, like, like I said last time, I mean, it might sound comical, but honestly the basic level understanding this is okay but to really feel what you know enlightened people feel i don't know i feel like we need to be making some steps and of course you'll tell me oh bhakti yoga karma yoga and all that stuff mm -hmm. but what he says is also valid you know that's also part of how you are trying to become an enlightened person I'm true like, oh, no but i'm not denying it what I said that, what did I say first? That is at the level of sadhana. Sadhana means spiritual practice. What he's basically trying to do is try to become a little better person than you are earlier. But you don't need me or the Vedanta Society to tell you that. We learned that in kindergarten. Tell the truth. Share your, your lunch. Uh, don't be mean to the uh, kid next to you. You don't need a Vedanta Society for that. What we are, be a little better than that. Obviously, that goes without saying. That goes without saying. But this goes to the root of the problem. What? This is the big question. 
This is the big question. Otherwise, what will happen, you know, is that if you go on, that's called the heaven concept. It's there in every religion. That can I make my life free of suffering? Old age, death, disease. Can I get rid of that? Still be this individual? Have fun? Eternally so. Yes, the answer to that, there's a word used in every religion. It's called heaven. Vedanta starts when you realize the heavens are also temporary. When you have such a deep and vast vision, this big question. So this way of continuing, will, will it go on? Will it be permanent? Will it be satisfactory? No. Ultimately, you will be dissatisfied with the heavens too. In Hinduism, they talk about many heavens. Lower and higher heavens. The, the better you are, the higher the heaven you go to. They're fantastic heavens. Uh, 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 Yama, the, the, this was the question put by the little boy to Nachiketa, to Yamaraja. Uh, Yamaraja said, don't ask me about this. Nachiketa insisted on knowing this. Yamaraja said, no. I think Yamaraja was the, <laughs> he had the right teaching technique. <laughs> You should come and ask me about Turiyam. I should say, no, I'm going to tell you about heaven. <laughs> and then you should say like Nachiketa, I don't care about heaven. I want to know about Turiyam. Then only the Vedanta class starts. <coughs> so, N Nachiketa, Yamaraja tells Nachiketa, don't ask about these things. Let me tell you how you're going to be rich and famous. I'll give you a kingdom as far as your eyes can see. You will live for a hundred years with your sons and grandsons. You will get the joys and the, the, the fun that the gods have in the heavens. He says, which are not available to mortal man. All those enjoyments you will get. Look, he says, look at these uh, heavenly damsels with their chariots and musical instruments. So the descriptions of heaven. All of that will be yours. And what? So basically the answer is exactly what you are saying. Can one have a nice life without the problems associated with it? That's the question. Answer is yes, you can have it. And not forever. Not only not forever. You still remain as that individual being and very soon you will get bored with that. Somerset mom said that, um, that if you pursue pleasure single-mindedly, very soon you will find nothing pleasing anymore. The one problem that the gods in the heavens have is that they get bored. They are having a lot of fun, but only fun and there is no problem at all. And then like Beverly Hills party going on and on and on and on in Hollywood. But the, the, and I'll, let me come complete. Now the thing is, what was Nachiketa's response to that? His response was that as long as you exist, O oh death, even the highest heavens mean nothing to me. Tomorrow it will be gone. Mm. Uh, tomorrow it will be gone. Therefore, and his answer was pretty rude for a little boy facing the king of death, the lord of death. His answer was, Keep your chariot, literally these words, keep your chariots, keep your singing and dancing. Let You have fun with that. I want to know Vedanta. And then Yama is very happy. All right, I will teach you Vedanta. It's like, you go to a shop uh, for clothes, expensive clothes. And in India, I don't know if their shops are there like that anymore. Earlier, the, the shopkeeper would come and roll out streams of clothes before you. You select, you know, like this. And this cloth, and that cloth, and this cloth. And then if you were a particularly discerning buyer, you would say, no, I don't like any of that. Don't you have anything better? And then the, the shop owner would say, yes, I have come to the back of the shop. I've got the special stuff I want to show you. The Vedas are like that. The Vedas tell you, you want to have a wonderful life? Be moral. Perform all the religious duties, the rituals. You will go to higher and higher heavens. This heaven is like that. That heaven is like that. And the higher heaven like that. And so on. You know, like up to the seventh heaven. It's a magnificent view of the possibilities of life. Beyond death. Life beyond death. If you're not happy with that, then the Vedas say, Okay, I have got the thing for you. Come to the back of the shop. The, the, the Vedic shop. It's a magic shop. When you go to the back, he will pull out. This is called, this is my secret stock. This is called the Mandukya Upanishad. 
which is something beyond the heavens. I'm going to show you that one reality, what happens? We'll, we'll talk about it uh, in the next uh, talk on Sunday. It's on, based on the second chapter of the Mandukya. You, Mandukya expects that instead of saying not this and that one, I, want, I will be like that and not like this, Mandukya says, see the one reality in the highest heaven and the lowest hell. In the most exalted samadhi and in the most ordinary mundane state of mind. <coughs> you will see that one turiyam everywhere. Thus you are free of everything. Otherwise what happens is, I like this, I will be like this, I don't like that, I will not be like that. And this is your life. A Zen master put it so beautifully, I like this. He says, to set one state of things against the other set of um, state of things by saying I like this and I do not like that is the special disease of the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. It applies down to, you were saying, talk about practical things. It is enormously practical. It, it applies to your choice of um, um, deodorant or your, um, you know, choice of your next entertainment you want to the highest metaphysical truths everything is in that thing that do I do I have likings this one I will do and not that one and I think if I get this then I am exalted I am happy I am blessed if I die if that thing happens then it's horrible my life is awful then you're caught in samsara it might be a minor thing it might be the most tragic of events if you're serene in all circumstances in absolutely all circumstances. Do you remember the story of Shukadeva who was turned into a camel by the Divine Mother? In all circumstances, you're absolutely serene. Then you are free. Aren't you free? Nothing that the universe does can have any effect on you. You are happy and blissful in every circumstance. But how is that possible? How can you be happy and blissful in every circumstance? If you are caught up in the circumstances, you cannot be happy and blissful. You will be crushed by the wheel of samsara. If you are caught up in a body-mind, you will be crushed by samsara because body-mind is a part of samsara. <coughs> but if you know the reality that you are the, something which transcends body-mind, which transcends this samsara, which is present in and through all samsaras, then you are established in the truth. And how do you know? You will know it yourself. But there will be no doubt about it. You will... What's your name? Mona. Now, see, Mona, you have no doubt that you are Mona. Mm -hmm. Right? Even in an even more direct and indubitable sense, you will know. When you wake up, you will know. There will be no doubt left at all. It's as, as clear as looking at the sun. Uh, re Swamiji, regarding the two stages of, uh, uh, of Vedanta, which you explained just some time back, mm -hmm. So the no suffering, the relief from all suffering, hmm. is that a product of the first stage or you have to go both the stages? Oh, this is a product of the first stage. The first stage that I am not the body and mind, I am the unchanging consciousness, the witness consciousness of body, mind and samsara of the world. That is the stage at which Sankhya stops. Patanjali Yoga also stops at that. It's called Prakriti Purusha Viveka. Hmm. Distinguishing consciousness from nature. And that itself overcomes suffering. So that's the promise of Sankhya and Yoga. Vedanta will say that's not yet fully satisfactory. What is this Prakriti that you have left out of your realization? You have not attained oneness with everything. So Vedanta goes a big step further. You go to oneness with the entire universe. But in the, yes, in the first step itself, when you realize yourself as the immortal consciousness, what suffering can there be for you? Um, let's just go a little further. Yada jiva prabuddhyate. Two verses. I just read it out. Very beautiful. And then next time we can discuss it. 17 and 18. Very profound. Prapancho yadi vidyeta. Prapancho yadi vidyeta. Nivarteta na samshaya, nivarteta na samshaya, maya matram idam dvaitam, maya matram idam dvaitam, 
What a beautiful verse. This phenomenal existence, this world, it would surely be, it, it would cease, it can be removed. You can become free of it. If it act, actually existed. <laughs> then the question of getting freedom from it would arise. There can be no serious question of being free of the snake which is seen by mistake. What method will you apply? If it was a real snake, you could have used a stake, you could have got a mongoose to drive it away, or a snake catcher, or just said shoe, or something. But to the snake which is born of ignorance, which is not really there, none of those methods will work. So, prapancho yadi vidyad, if the universe existed, you could have the question of how to remove samsara, how to remove this afflicted existence. It does not exist. What is it? Maya matram midam dvaitam. This duality is born of ignorance. It has no substantial reality. It's one thing to understand. Advaita is not eager to erase the experience of the world. I'm using words very carefully. An enlightened person, does that person continue to experience the body, mind and the world? Yes. Advaita is not eager to remove the experience of the world. Advaita wants to make you free from it. Advaita wants to say that you don't get tangled in it. Entangled in it. Enjoy this. Be limitless, be completely free within this experience. All of it is you or none of it is you. Our whole thing is we get trapped is because we think a part of it is me. This much is me and that much is not me and both are very real. Then starts the game of samsara. But Advaita says, first of all, everything from the body, mind up to the farthest reaches of the universe is an appearance of the thurium which you are, number one. And it has no real effect on you. There is no need to erase this. It can go on. Let it go on. Let the fun go on. There is absolutely no problem. Advaita does not say that you sit with your eyes closed in samadhi. Somebody asked a great teacher in India. Advaita keeps seems to say two things. Brahman alone is all of this. And all of this is false. Which one? How are we to understand these two? And the answer was, imagine a vast ocean. When it is whipped up into waves and activities, then you say, take that that Brahman alone is all of this. It's appearing as all of this. When it is absolutely calm, imagine an ocean which is calm, waveless. Then use the other one. There is nothing, the samsara doesn't exist at all. The vast waveless ocean is like Nirguna Brahman. And the ocean in with all these waves is like Brahman appearing as this entire universe. It's exactly the same thing. And the next part I found was, next instruction I found was really profound. He says, as a spiritual practitioner, as a non-dualist, the Hindi word he used is, you should have no preference for either of them. What a beautiful thing. That the universe will disappear and it will remain in eternal peace. There is a little bit of ignorance there. Or I want it to be like this. Full of happening, a spiritual joy, a vastness, a continuous dynamic universe. That also you should not get stuck to. When the universe disappears completely, Brahman remains exactly as it was. When the entire universe appears, with body, mind, all its problems, possibilities, the joys and sorrows, all of it going on, Brahman remains exactly as it was. And you are that Brahman. You should have no particular favorite that I want that state in preference to this state. Often spiritual aspirants always want the peaceful state. Vivekananda said, I shall remain in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Sri Ramakrishna scolded him. But that still shows a little bit of, um, uh, little bit of ignorance that somehow that is higher, this is a little lower. It's the same ocean. 
It's the same ocean, exactly the same water. Just that there is an appearance of name, form and activity here. Every bit of it is the same Satchidananda. When the appearance disappears, it's still the same Satchidananda. Materially, substantially, in reality, not the slightest difference is there. And nor should we look for one in preference to the other. If you're looking for one in preference to the other, somewhere we are attached to something that's not real. So why are you, why are you a monk then? What do you, what are this, what aren't you trying to also sort of like still, I don't know, become enlightened? I mean, yeah, isn't absolutely. That, isn't that the whole purpose of becoming a monk? And no, there are, there are two questions. Two questions you asked, separate the two. Why are you a monk? Question one. Question two is, why are you trying to get enlightened? The first question is easily answered. The second one is deep. First question is, why are you a monk? It's a, you know, they'll say a lifestyle choice. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like saying, um, you don't have to be a computer scientist to use your iPhone. You don't have to be Zuckerberg to use Facebook. <laughs> Anybody can use it. That's the whole trick. Anybody can use it. So, but there are specialists who are computer scientists. You need those two. Right? So just like that, you don't have to be a monk to become enlightened. But still, there is the need for monks and theologians and pundits and scholars and rabbis and you know, specialists in that particular field. It's, there's a need. Some people can be that and some people should be that. Ramana Maharshi was asked this and his answer is the simplest answer. He was asked by a lady who was a housewife. Do you have to be a monk to become enlightened? And he said no. And then her question was even more direct than your question. She said, then why are you sitting in a cave? Like the idea was I have to cook meals and take care of my children and all of that. And you're sitting in a cave. You're having a the nice time of it. Lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lifestyle. See, wh why are you sitting in this, in this cave with a serene smile and wearing a diaper? <laughs> His an answer was, mother, that is just my karma and your karma. It has nothing to do with enlightenment. In your particular, he didn't explain with so much detail. He just said it's because of my karma and your karma. But that has nothing to do with enlightenment. If you want in your place, working where you are as a housewife, you can become enlightened. And becoming a monk and sitting in a cave and meditating, I might not become enlightened. Might not. It doesn't guarantee that I'm going to become enlightened. So is the monk, being a monk has nothing to do with enlightenment? No, that's not true. Obviously it's not true. Being a monk has a deep connection with enlightenment, but only the interiority has a deep connection. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna put it this way. For householders, he said, bhetorityag. And for, he said, uh, renunciation, in, inner renunciation. And for monks, he said, both inner and outer renunciation. So this is the first question. Second question was, why are you seeking enlightenment? Because I suffer. I want to overcome suffering. I want to find that promise, that Serenity, the bliss. Who doesn't want it? Don't that, go for the heavens though. You've got to go to consciousness. Remember that. That's true. <laughs> Everybody else is basically gunning for the heaven concept. I want to make certain changes to my life and I'll be happy. I often think, or we'll end with that. Uh, I often think, you know, immature persons, we start off by trying to change things in the world. I'll get these positions, I'll get a nice house and a nice location, nice school district. Yeah. I'll be happy. That doesn't make me happy. And next, I think, I'll tra change the people in my life. <laughs> make a better husband, better wife, better children. No, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to make a change in oneself. It's impossible to make change in others. Almost impossible. Then we try to change ourselves. And then we start at the most outermost layer of ourselves. I'll have a healthy, gluten-free yoga body. <laughs> I'll get up early in the morning and then do this exercise and then do, do, do this and that. That's good. But then you see that limitation of that approach. Then you say, okay, I'll go deeper. Hmm. I will change. My, see, now you're going deeper. I'll change my very thoughts. 
I'll have high, noble, holy, spiritual thoughts. Spiritual practice. So I have bhakti. I have. Then you say you go deeper. Why thoughts at all? I'll be in the deepest peace in meditation. Raja Yoga. Samadhi. You go further still till you come to Mandukya which says just realize what you are. The one which is trying to make all these changes from the world outside to the mind. All these changes are being trying, trying to make. Who is the one trying to make that? Mandukya says all of them apart. They have their uses. But you realize this one, your problems are really solved forever. No matter what kind of world you live in, no matter what kind of body you have, no matter what kind of husband, wife, children you have, no matter what kind of mind you have, your problems are forever solved. Don't realize that and try to change these things. Your problems are temporarily solved. You'll have other problems. All right. Hmm. I, mean, I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but it seems like every time that he's in Samadhi, right? Obviously, from his perspective, it's just consciousness. It's just, I mean, there's nothing to explain. Yes. But then when he comes, I don't want to say he comes down to the lower plane, but that consciousness, as he once said, oh, I have become. Hmm. From Brahma to Shakti, Shakti to Brahma. Yeah. Like that transition, like every time he comes back, if you notice, that there's always like some sort of, of drunkenness. Oh, that's true. Like yeah. That. Yeah. It's like something interesting to know. Like every time that happens. Yeah, it, it does. Other, other people too from Samadhi coming back down. Hmm. It's like that they seem lost. It's like when they seem like lost, up, yes. It's like yes. A yeah, yeah. To fit yourself back into this frame of reference again takes a lot of effort and limitation to limit yourself <laughs> much further. Yeah. So it's like a, it has no beginning. Like where, where did he start? Where did he end? It's like a beginning where it's like long. It's like coming back into the illusion again. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. I'll take just one minute more of your time. No, no more questions. Because I want to finish this. Um, This Dvaitam duality is an appearance. Non-duality is the highest reality. Then the last karika, the 18th karika. Vikalpo vinivarteta Vikalpo vinivarteta Kalpito yadike na chet Kalpito yadike na chet Upadeshadayam vado, Upadeshadayam vado, Yate dvaitam na vidyate, Yate dvaitam na vidyate. He goes even further. He said, All right, but I am this individual who is having this error. So I must realize myself as Turiyam. So I am having, I am living this dream. Here he says, This could be removed if. There was anybody having a dream also. Turiyam does not dream. Right? So, there, if there is anybody having a dream at all, even the individual being, the knower, that also he denies. So, vikalpo vinivarteta, diversity, duality would be removed. Kalpito yadikenachit, if there was any particular knower who knows this duality, then we could remove the, the, the dream of that, that knower. But that there is no individual knower also. Turiyam is the ultimate reality. Then you might say, now you are just talking crazy. Because <laughs> all along you are talking about individual being and bondage and ignorance and knowing the Turiyam. And then you have to get out of Turi, uh, the ignorance and realize, awaken to the Turiyam and realize that you are Turiyam. All this talk. What's all this? If there is nobody like that. If there is only <laughs> Turiyam. And then he says, Upadesha Dayam Vada. This kind of talk is there only for instruction. You cannot teach without the language of duality. That's why we are talking, we are using the language of duality. All this teaching is in the language of duality. You'll see it assumes duality basically. Without assuming duality, you cannot teach Vedanta. If you don't assume that, the only option left for you is silence. Which Raman Marshi would often use that. Just sit in silence. Upadesha Dayam Vada. All this language, these examples, these paradigms which are being put forward. Four aspects of the self and all of this. Not true at all. But this is being used so that our uh, error is corrected. Duality is removed. Gyate dvaitam navidyate. Once you realize the truth, the duality will not remain. 
and you will see all of this is just temporary. It's like a scaffolding which you use to erect a building. Once it's done, the scaffolding has to be removed. You know, it, it'll come. We'll talk about it this Sunday. When you dismiss everything as false, this Sunday we'll, we'll take a karika from the second chapter of the uh, Mandukya karika, where Gaurapada just goes to the extreme. I mean, you can't say anything more than that. There he says, there is no samsara which was ever created, no samsara which is destroyed, nobody who is in bondage, nobody who is a spiritual seeker, nobody who, gets, uh, who wants liberation, nobody who gets liberation. This is the final truth. Huh? It's a movie. So, uh, he just says that. Now, if you say this, I'll end with this, that if you say this, the next question that comes is, then what about you, Mr. Vedanta? Are you true or false? Because everything is false, what about you? And there Vedanta says, ah, you've got it. I am also false. <laughs> I am also false. I am also false, but the point is, I am here to show you the falsity of the world. Once you realize the falsity of the world, you can dismiss me as being false. Then what is the truth? You alone remain as the truth. Not you and Vedanta. You alone remain as the truth. But beware, do not dismiss me before you have falsified the world experience. If you dismiss Vedanta as false before falsifying the world, you'll sink back into materialism again. It, it, it's very, it has to be very careful. Nagarjuna, the great Buddhist philosopher, he says, Shunyata, the teaching of the void, he says, Shunyata is meant for seeing the, the <coughs> emptiness of the universe. The teaching of emptiness, Shunyata, is meant for seeing the emptiness of the universe. So, do, for those who take the universe to be real, the teaching of Shunyata reveals the emptiness of the universe. Then he says, but those who take Shunyata to be real, for them there is no help. <coughs> shunyata can free you from the universe. But if you grasp to, onto Shunyata itself, then there is no help for you. Shunyata itself is also false. Yes. Alright, we'll stop here. <coughs> Six o'clock. We've been at it for two hours. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu